Well, I, I do hope you've enjoyed these last three days. I sure have. We've um, I've had a good time just sharing the word with you. It's been very receptive, and so we've, we've really enjoyed it, so we appreciate it. Uh, we look forward to coming back again. Like I said at the beginning of the seminar, I do believe that this is the beginning of, of a move of God in South Australia and throughout all Australia. But really, God can only move as his people move. So if you want to see a move of God, you've got to be a move of God. Amen? And so you have to continue on with this. You have to continue forward with it. Now, we have um, asked several things and asked different things about whether you want to get connected or not. Let me just ask you this very quickly. Uh, is there anybody that has, you fill out the piece of paper that has your contact info on it, you want to be connected, you want to get involved in this, that you have not turned it in? If you have that, then if you will, just please fill that out and get it finished up and then turn it in to us. We'll make sure we get in contact with you. And then one other thing I'm going to ask you before we get started here is that we've mentioned these uh, small groups, the, what we call our life teams, which are teams of people that are trained to minister and they learn the Word of God to minister to the people in the city. So <clears throat> now that means usually it's like a small cell group type of thing, usually six, eight, ten people in their home. Uh, how many of you think you might be involved in either attending a meeting like that on kind of a weekly or every other week basis kind of thing or and or you'd be involved you might be interested in actually hosting one either attending or hosting let me see your hands okay all right all right yeah Enzo you see that <laughs> okay yeah yeah y'all know Enzo right everybody know Enzo Enzo wave him there he is right there in the corner all right now if you just raised your hand and said that you want to get involved then I urge you tonight, before you leave, see Enzo, tell him that you raised your hand, that you want to get involved, and we will get you plugged in, all right? This is vitally important. I can't, I can't stress this enough. So if you want to attend a life team or you want to host a life team, either way, see Enzo, and we'll get you started, okay? We'll give you more details about it, um, <clears throat> but I just wanted to get that done so we have a good idea of what we're seeing here because usually when you see that you can tell who you're going to be working with what's going to go on and how it's going to move forward so that's what I want to know all right now all right if you have your Bibles <clears throat> go ahead and take them out if you have a manual you can turn to chapter 3 in the manual okay now <clears throat> chapter 3 in the manual okay we're going to be looking at divine healing in the atonement Divine healing in the atonement. Now, there's two kinds of people here. There are the well and the sick. Okay? Now, if you have been in the training, then we're going to continue the training just for a little bit here. We're not going to go late tonight by any stretch. But I want to share this with you because of everything we've taught, we've taught you a lot of details, a lot of pieces and different things. But you have to realize that if I can't prove to you that healing is in the atonement of Jesus Christ, in other words, if I can't prove to you that he paid for every person's healing, then you can never pray in faith. You're always guessing and wondering if it's God's will. But if I can prove to you that Jesus paid for, for the healing of every person, then it is no longer a question about God's will. It is just a question about your perseverance to get it done. Amen? And so, <clears throat> now, if you've not been to the training, but you've come for healing, that is fine. And you're certainly welcome to listen to what I'm going to say tonight. But we're not relying on you necessarily having faith for your healing. We have been learning and studying the Word of God, and we have found that the Word of God says that we can have faith for you. And so, tonight, if you need healing, we're going to have faith for you. Now, if you have faith, that's wonderful. Don't get rid of it. Hang on to it, all right? But <clears throat> you don't have to have faith for yourself. We can have it for you, okay? Now, next. Oh, there was a, a statement, yes. Today, we talked about the anointing, and we talked about the power of God being on you, and we talked about you feeling it or not feeling it, and I showed you how Samson didn't, couldn't tell it because there was no feeling associated with it. Now, and somebody is thinking because they ask a question, good question because <clears throat> we had made the statement that you didn't necessarily feel it or wouldn't feel it and that kind of thing 
But they said Jesus felt power. Whenever the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment, he felt virtue go out of him. That's good. But the difference is that woman, Jesus is walking alone, and that woman came up to him. He didn't know who she was, didn't know anything about it. That's pretty. <laughs> didn't, know who, didn't know anything about her, didn't know she was coming or anything, and she pulled out of him. Now, see, if you are ministering, you know what you're doing, you're geared toward it, and you may or may not feel anything. But if you're walking along and somebody grabs the hem of your garment and starts to, to pull the power of God out of you, yeah, you probably will feel it because it is not what is going on with you right then. You understand? It is different. But whenever you're ministering, it's not different. This is what you're doing. So you're ministering by faith, not by feeling. You understand that? So that's why that is. Now, it is, matter of fact, out of all of the healings that Jesus did, and there were times when it said that he healed multitudes, right? It said there were multitudes there and that he healed them all. And then it said, one time it even said he healed all them that had need of healing. That's a pretty good crowd. And out of all those times, this is the only time that it mentions him feeling anything. Right? Now, you can't build a doctrine on a one-time thing. You understand? Everything has to be collaborated or corroborated by, in the mouth of two or more witnesses. Amen? All right, so I just wanted to, to emphasize that. Now, so hopefully you have found chapter 3 of your manual. If you don't have a manual and you want to follow, follow along, we're going to go to two places, three places actually, but two of the main ones. We're going to go to Psalm 103. We're going to go to Isaiah 53. We'll probably go to, yep, we probably will go to Matthew chapter 8. Okay, I'm just giving you a couple of them ahead of time so you'll know where we're going. <clears throat> I will quote 1 Peter 2, 24. We don't necessarily have to turn there, but so just giving you some of the ideas of where we're going to go, all right? Now, and if I get a chance, I'll tell you how I found out about the fact that you don't feel the anointing, so... No, or what we call the anointing sometimes. Now, first off, yep, okay. <clears throat> the first off, there are three things that pretty much any person that has ever been used greatly in the area of healing that they understood and knew. Generally, they knew dominion. They had some idea of the authority of Jesus that they would exercise that authority. Number two, they had a dependence on the Holy Spirit knowing that the Holy Spirit is the one that actually does the healing. And number three, they understood that healing was in the atonement and every person's healing was paid for. Okay? Very few people operate very strongly at all in healing without understanding that healing is in the atonement. Now, you want to look at a couple of things on here because <clears throat> I want to... I'll read this to you, but I also want to read a letter. Well, actually, I'm going to read the letter to you first. Hang, hang in the place there where you're at in chapter 3. But go back. Go back to page 83 of your manual. <clears throat> Remember, hold your place in chapter 3. Because we're going to go right back there. I just want to read these to you to, to give you some uh, proof, I guess I would say. On page 83 of the manual, this is a personal memory that uh, Gordon Lindsay had of John G. Lake. Now, if you've not been in the meetings and you don't know who John G. Lake was, that's no big deal. He has, he has nothing to do with your healing. You, you know, John Lake didn't die for your healing, right? He was a man, but he understood healing, and so that's where we learned a lot about healing from, was through his teaching. Now, all he did was just say, the Bible's true, and point out things in the Bible. So it wasn't like some strange, unusual thing, Okay. <clears throat> so, but in, on page 83 it says, and this is what Gordon Lindsay said about Dr. Lake. He says, it is an underestimate to say that the ministry of John G. Lake was unusual. He possessed the remarkable ability to create faith in his hearers. Ministers who sat under him soon found that they too had a ministry of faith that resulted in healings of a most startling character. And that's pretty good. Right? Whenever you can sit and listen to somebody and you get faith for that and then you start seeing the 
remarkable manifestations of the Spirit of God in your ministry, right? That's a good thing. He says, since it was impossible for Dr. Lake to minister personally to the great numbers that sought his services, he usually had a band of lay ministers and workers called divine healing technicians that had been trained in what you now know, because this is what I taught you this week, laboring with him to answer calls to which he was unable to attend. One of the writer's first memories of a healing was that of a woman who was instantly healed as a result of a prayer, of the prayers, of one of Dr. Lake's ministers. Not Dr. Lake, but a man that worked under him. Okay? The woman <clears throat> was a Mrs. Watts. She was the wife of a prominent officer of a local church. This woman had become seriously ill, and the physicians decided that her only hope was an immediate operation. The cost of the proposed operation was well beyond the family's financial resources at the time. However, in desperation, the husband went to a local bank and arranged for a loan to pay the cost of the operation. In the meantime, the writer's mother, Gordon Lindsay's mother, who had great faith in divine healing, felt a burden to pray for the family. She went to the sick woman and encouraged her to believe God for healing. But the woman's church had taught against divine healing, and in fact, the woman herself had not taken any interest in this teaching. But as is often the case when desperate illness or death faces one, they are inclined to alter their views. The lady consented that prayer should be offered for her healing. Mother then took the next train to Portland in hope of getting Dr. Lake to come to pray for the woman. However, when she arrived there, he was not available, and as the need was urgent, Mother requested that one of the other ministers go. Now listen to the description of this guy, because I really, when I started reading this, I realized how much I like this guy. Okay? The good brother who went did not have much of a knowledge of social amenities. Okay? In fact, he was a rather rough and ready preacher, hardly to be distinguished for his ministerial polish. Now, when I read that, I thought, I just like this guy. I can tell already I liked him, right? But his faith in God was strong, and though he had acquired a rather brusque, unceremonious manner of dealing with the sick, it produced results even though his mannerisms sometimes offended people of a of fastidious taste, <laughs> right? You just kind of get an idea of how this guy must have been, right? When mother and this preacher arrived at the home of the sick woman, and he had opportunity to observe her critical condition. He lost no time in telling her that the sickness was the work of the devil. Now, you know that didn't go over good, right? I mean, this woman was a wife of a prominent officer in the church, probably socially, you know, in good standing, well-liked, well-thought-of. She gets sick, and this preacher comes over and looks at her and says, Oh, you got a devil. Okay, you know that didn't go over, Right? And he said, after giving the woman some instructions, he proceeded to rebuke the illness with a loud, booming voice that carried through the whole house. Then, rather roughly, he told the woman that she was healed and for her to get out of bed. Now, apparently she didn't know she was healed, but he said she was healed. The lady at first hesitated to do this, but shortly afraid to disobey. So apparently he made some kind of impact on her, right? Apparently she thought it would be worse to disobey him than to disobey the illness or the devil, right? Shortly afraid to disobey, she did as she was told and rose from her bed to discover to her great joy that she was made whole. You know, she didn't feel made whole. She was healed and didn't know it, okay? The pastor of the local church was at that time very much opposed to this ministry, this miracle was the first step in convincing him of its reality. Eventually, he became convinced of its scriptural foundation and received a notable healing himself. That kind of says something right there. Incidentally, the banker who had loaned the money for the proposed operation was startled indeed a few days afterward to see the husband come to the bank to return the money. It was a testimony which caused many in the community to wonder and take note. Such were the methods used and the results obtained 
that gave the, the work of John G. Lake the prominence that it achieved. Amen? Now, that wasn't even John Lake. That was somebody else. And let me, matter of fact, it was so common that they didn't even record the minister's name that did it. Right? And that's the way it should be. Okay? Now, on the next page, there's a letter that Dr. Lake wrote from South Africa in 1911. Now, you realize this is 1911. Now, here we are almost at 2011. Almost 100 years later. Right? Now, watch this. He says here, uh, so I'm not going to read all of it, but I want you to read part of it. <clears throat> yeah. Down about halfway through the first page there, he says, However, we praise God that he is moving strong and steady and clearly. I am reminded to write you through the reading of Mrs. Anderson's testimony as it appears in the Triumphs of Faith. That's a newsletter. I haven't a copy of a letter I wrote some time ago to a missionary by the name of Hoover at Valparaiso, Chile, on the subject of divine healing, which embodies what I regard as the secret of the aggressive ministry of healing that the Pentecostal movement of South Africa demonstrates. So he wrote a letter that told the secret of what they were doing. So when I read that, I thought, where is that letter? I want that letter. I want to know what the secret is. Well, kind of find out he actually wrote the secret in this letter. Because he says, I do not know that I'll be able to send you a, a copy of, it, of that letter at this time, but at my earliest convenience, we'll have a copy prepared and send it to you. He says, I feel, sister, that there is a step in this ministry in advance of what the Pentecostal movement in general enjoys. In other words, we're, we're seeing more power than the average Pentecostal church. <clears throat> now, and God has laid it deeply on my soul to present this particular phase of the exercise of the dominion of Jesus Christ. You hear that? He, so he's telling a secret. Watch. And that the secret of our success here in this ministry, and he's going to tell you what it is, is in our teaching our workers to exercise the dominion of God through the Holy Ghost and that he has already put it in their soul when he baptized them. Do you get that? He's saying the secret is I teach our workers they've already got it. Isn't that what you've been hearing this week? He says, while in other branches of this work, they still follow largely the old line of intercession for the sick. In other words, they're still begging God to come do it. And he said, we don't do that anymore. Watch. He says, we do not pray for God to come and heal as in the old days. But looking into his face, believing that he has baptized us in the Holy Ghost and that we have received the power of God through that baptism, we command in the name of Jesus the devil and his works to depart. Now, isn't that what you've been hearing this week? Okay. <clears throat> now, he says, Nevertheless, dear sister, there are instances when God puts the spirit of real intercession even for the sick upon you. Remember I told you today, that's when they're not there and you can't see them, so you pray and you do the over life. Remember, not overkill, over life. Okay. He says, <clears throat> I am convinced that there is a secret and better place of interceding for the sick in exercising a dominion of God over the devil and his sicknesses that when learned by the Pentecostal movement will put the ministry of healing miles in advance of where it is now. Now, he wrote that 100 years ago, and the church never caught it, and it never got miles in advance of where it was then. Matter of fact, pretty much the church is... Actually, the funny thing is, this was written 100 years ago, and the church is still doing the thing he said they don't do anymore. So the church is actually backed up. Not advanced, but actually backed up from where he was 100 years ago. Right? Now, he says... His name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong. So he starts quoting some of the scriptures that I read to you this week. <clears throat> he says, It was through the healing of a young man from Detroit, Michigan, in your faith home at Buffalo, that my interest for this ministry was first captured. It was not until many years afterward, when, through the teaching of John Alexander Dowie, that I really grasped the thing so that the knowledge of the ministry became vital or real. And it was only after I had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost that the dominion of God entered my soul that compelled me to command sickness and the devil to leave rather than to intercede with the Lord to take them away. Now again, isn't that what you've been hearing this week? So 
He just told all the secret. He told everything he was doing. He told the reason he got all that success and healing. And what he said, you've been taught this week. So there's no reason why it won't work for you. Now, <clears throat> last thing's the next page over. And then we're going to move into the, well, I'll show you out of Isaiah 53. That's the main thing. Next page over, it says, John Lake talked about how to enter into God's will. He said there are two phases of entering into, to, into the will of God. The first phase is the surrender of your will to do the will of God. Okay, that's called getting born again. That's what being born again is, is surrendering your will to do God's will. Most people's conception of doing the will of God is to become a non-entity. In other words, you just empty yourself and let God do whatever. That's not biblical. Now, it is not God's ideal for you to have to be pushed around like a machine or move like a mechanism. The other phase is recognizing yourself as God's son and man's servant. I think the most wonderful exhibition of this truth that God can give us is in the fact that he gives us the Holy Ghost to use for God. You hear that? He gives us the Holy Ghost to use for God. Now, that's the opposite of the way most people see it. Most people say, well, he gives us to God or he gives us the Holy Ghost so that we can be used for God. But he said, no, he gives you the Holy Ghost so that you can use the Holy Ghost for God. Watch. <clears throat> he says, for instance, the Lord says, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But if you do not lay your hands upon anyone, they will not be healed. However, if you have faith to believe that you have the Holy Spirit to be used by him and for him, your heart and your hands will be ready. It's a sad thing to me that God has to go out on a special mission and hunt a soul up and wrestle with him in order to get him to do something for God. That is pretty sad. There used to be a Bible school in Ohio where they waited in continuous prayer meeting for nine months for the gifts of the Holy Ghost. I said to them, and that sounds kind of like a regular revival meeting we hear about today, doesn't it? Getting together, get on their face and calling out for God for nine months or a year or whatever. I said to them, it seems to me if you stay around for ten years in nine months, you'll miss the gifts of the Holy Ghost. But if you take off your coat and go out and use what God has given you to bless others, he will give you more. Now, isn't that what you've been hearing this week? Right? So all I'm proving to you is what you've been getting is the real deal. Amen? <clears throat> now, in, I wanted to explain something to you. If you have a Bible, go to Mark 11, or I'm sorry, Mark 16 real quick, okay? <clears throat> Don't worry, we'll get where we need to get. It's not going to take me long to tell you about healing and the atonement. It's going to be pretty quick. I'm just going to show you a couple of things to prove it to you. But Mark 16 is really, really important. And remember, those of you that are listening right now, uh, I'm mainly talking to the people that have been going through the training. Those of you that are sick and need healing, not really talking to you at this point. You're, you're welcome to listen, but this is not stuff you have to know. This is the stuff that people that are going to minister to you has to know. Okay? And I'm sure you want them fully trained. Amen? <clears throat> okay. So Mark 16. I'm going to show you something here real quick, if I can get there. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> In Mark 16, verse 20. Now, we, we mentioned this the other day, but I didn't get too far into it. And they went forth, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. Right? That's what it says, right? Is that what your Bible say? That's what it says, right? Okay. Now notice. <clears throat> so that he said that believers are going to lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Now when you lay hands on the sick, now, now notice. You have the Holy Spirit in you, the power of God in you. When you lay hands on the sick, the Holy Spirit has to work through you. You get it? Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't go before you. You understand that? The Holy Spirit's waiting for you to lay hands because if, if you lay hands and the sick recover, who recovered the sick? The Holy Spirit. He did the work, right? You, you can't heal. The Holy Spirit heals. But the Holy Spirit waits till you lay hands. So you have to lay hands first, then the Holy Spirit can touch them. Correct? 
and by that, then he does the signs of the actual healing. So step one, what do you got to do? Lay hands. Step two, they get healed. How do they get healed? Holy Spirit. So your step one, Holy Spirit, step two. Right? Holy Spirit isn't step one. Holy Spirit's waiting on you to do step one. So now, now listen to this. <clears throat> Notice. They preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word with signs following. Signs do what? Follow. Signs don't lead. You don't follow signs. Signs follow you. Who works the signs? Who makes the signs happen? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit makes the signs happen, makes the healing happen. If the Holy Spirit's making them happen and the signs follow you, and it's the Holy Spirit to make the signs happen, I know I'm repeating myself. I'm doing it on purpose. Okay, don't don't think I've lost my train of thought. Okay, <clears throat> you lay hands. Signs follow. Holy Spirit does the signs. The Holy Spirit follows you laying hands. Is that correct? So you step one, you lay hands. Step two, Holy Spirit heals. So if the signs follow and the Holy Spirit is doing the signs, and the signs are following, and they're following you, then who's following you? The Holy Spirit's following you. You're not following the Holy Spirit. Right? Well, we're just going to follow the Holy Ghost. Mm, not, not really. You're going to preach the gospel. You're going to lay hands on the sick, and the Holy Ghost is waiting on you to do it. So he's following you because he makes the signs happen, and the signs follow you and follow the preaching of the word. And fo- so far, basically, you've got, you got to preach. You've got to lay hands. Then the Holy Spirit shows up. Amen? So you're not following the Holy Ghost. He's following you. Why? Because he was given to you. You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Amen? I'm trying to show you how, how in union you are with him, but you're not, you are relying on him, but he's waiting on you. You get that? You are relying on him, but he is waiting on you. You're not waiting on him. Right? You're not following him. Now, you're being led by the Spirit, which means you're being led by his nature and his character to do the things that you do. That's what leads you to do the things you do. But he is actually still following you because he's got to work the signs that you're preaching about. Right? You get that? Now, <clears throat> go with me. Let, me. let me give you the example. I went to, um, I was preaching up in South Bend, Indiana one time. And they had an old car dealership. Well, it wasn't old at that point, but it was a car manufacturing plant. And they had this, we went in this huge plant. And you had to walk up these stairs and then go into this little room at the top. And when you went in there, there was this guy sitting there. It was air conditioned. It was nice. The guy was relaxing. He wasn't sweating. He wasn't working hard. He wasn't having to do a lot of exercise, you know, or a lot of strenuous work. He was just sitting there. We walked in. He said, hey, how you doing? He looks like I'm just... And he had these, these, these things there. It looked like joysticks, you know, like on a game thing. <clears throat> and this thing had this arm. Now, he was in this little bitty room, and it was huge. And there were these car bodies all over the, the, the building floor and chassis and all that kind of stuff. And he would just sit there, and he would just take this thing and tap it. Boom, boom, boom. And this big arm was underneath that thing. It was like a crane. And this thing would go out, and he would tap, and there would be a car, and he'd just tap it, tap it, whoop, and that thing would go do, 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 right to when you go, whoop, no, 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 back there, whoop, 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 there, oh, there. You see, and he would just move it. And he, this arm was huge. And he would drop down, and he would pick up a car, because he had this thing here, and he would move it, and he would push the button, and he would grab this car, and he would go pull it up, and he would raise, you know, 2,500, 3,000 pounds right there, right? And just pull it up, and then he would move it, and he would move over, and he would set it down. Now, all he, he didn't even break a sweat. He was just sitting there tapping this little joystick. Boom, boom, there you go, there you go. And he made it look so easy. I mean, I'd have been over there trying to, oh, here we go, you know, but he wasn't doing that. He just tap, 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 oh, there, okay, there you go, yeah. Pick it up, and there we go, back, and just, and he was just moving these cars around. 3,000 pound cars. And he was moving them with two fingers. You get it? 
Isn't that easy? And he was moving it. Now, if he'd have went downstairs, went down there and tried to pick that car up, he couldn't have lifted it with both hands, both legs, and everything. But because he had this joystick and it was on the end of that crane and he could just tap it, he was moving a whole car. Why? Because the company knew that they wanted that car moved. Right? The company wanted the car moved. And they knew he couldn't do it by himself. So the company gave him a helper. Amen. Right? To move the car bodies. Now, the helper, all the helper did, the helper did nothing on its own. Right? That crane didn't move by itself. The crane, all it did, now get this, all it did was amplify the intentions of the operator. That's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. God wants people's bodies fixed. He knows that we can't do it on our own. So he gives us a helper. And the helper, all he does is amplify our intentions. You want to say, well, I thought it was God's intentions. Well, it is God's intentions that everybody's be healed. But he amplifies our specific intentions when we lay hands on individual people. You get it? That's what the Holy Spirit is for you. All he is is your helper. Now, the problem is, you don't want a helper. You want him to do it. You never find it that he is the doer. James 1.22 says, you be doers of the word. Right? And he said he will give you a helper. Now, he didn't say he would give you a doer, and your job was to help the doer. See, that's why things don't work in the church. We've traded places. We're the doers. The Holy Spirit's the helper. But instead, we try to help God and make him the doer, and we just try to help him. What The helper can't help if he's doing. The helper's job is to help. Your job is to do. As you do, the helper helps. If you're not going to do, the helper can't help. You understand that? So our problem is we want to make it easy for God. We want to get everything right, everything perfect, make it easy for God. <clears throat> Elijah didn't do that. Elijah, when they were, had the prophets of Baal and they were all jumping around and shouting, trying to bring fire down to start the fire, they were trying to do everything to help their God. And Elijah, now get this, Elijah is sitting over there watching them. And he starts making fun of them. Starts, I mean, making fun. I mean, talking to them. Hey, why don't y'all yell louder? Maybe your God's going on a vacation. He, you go back and read it. He even said, maybe your God's in the toilet. Now, that's not polite. He wasn't sitting there being, you know, spiritual and being polite to them and saying, well, you know, we're just going to let everybody be alone. No, he's making fun of these people. He said, why don't you shout louder? Why don't you do all these things? He's making fun of them. And then finally they give up, and he says, okay, here's what we're going to do. He went over, and he said, now, you see this altar that they were trying to bring fire down? Go get water. Pour it on the wood. Do it again. Do it again. Soak it up good. Pour in it. And, I mean, he did everything he could do to make it as hard for God to light that fire as he could. He didn't help God light it. He didn't light a match and say, here, God, if you, I'll light the match, and you just... You just blow on it and start a big fire. He didn't do that. He said, nope, pour water. Let's make it hard on God. I'm going to show you. You see, you're trying to help God, and Elijah says, no, let's make it hard on God. The harder we make it on God, the greater glory he gets when it happens. But see, we're always trying to make it easy on God. You know why? Because you think his arm is shortened. You think he needs the help, which shows you really don't have faith in him anyway. But the truth is, God don't need your help. He needs you to be obedient. He needs you to do what you're supposed to do. And when you do, he will send the helper to help you. So quit trying to help God. Do what you're supposed to do. And then the helper can help. Amen? Now, we know that the helper's part is actually bigger than our part. Our part's pretty small. We're just being obedient and doing what he said to do. But the helper is the one that actually makes it happen. Amen? You see that? Isn't that simple? So that's what we're going to do tonight. Now, <clears throat> go with me. You have that, the manual. Go back to Healing in the Atonement, chapter 3, verse, uh, page 21. <clears throat> I just want to hit these two, hit these couple of things very quick. Psalm 103, verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. 
Now, right there, that's a command. Number one, you notice David always talked to his soul. He, was, he said, bless the Lord, O my soul. You know, now, see, we sing it as a song, and it's a real pretty song. And it was a song to David. But David used it to talk to himself about God. And he said, soul, you will bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, soul. Bless it. See, he wasn't just singing some pretty song. It had a reason for it. But he said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Don't forget his benefits. Now watch. He says, and he starts listing the benefits. Who forgives all thine iniquities? How many iniquities? So is all all or is it just some? So is there any iniquities that aren't forgiven? Okay. Oh, that got weak. Yeah. Okay. Who heals all thy diseases? How many? Are there any diseases that are not healed? Now, you have to realize, there are <clears throat> books in the law. Back in the United States, 1863, we were in the middle of a civil war. <clears throat> I'm not going to go into a lot of details on it, but a lot of what you've heard about the civil war, even what you've heard in the United States, if you've been around there, is not true. And was, you know, the victors write the, the history books. Okay? Well, I'm from the South. So, <clears throat> now, we have a slightly different take on it. <laughs> okay? <clears throat> okay? It, and first off, you can tell that they were lying when they wrote about it because there's never been a, such a thing as a civil war. Isn't that right? There ain't nothing civil about a war. Right? So that right there tells you that somebody's lying anyway to begin with. Anyway, so... <clears throat> At that time, the North was losing most of their fights. And the South was winning most of them. And so they needed a whole bunch of new people. So Abraham Lincoln stands up and gives what he calls the proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation. <coughs> In that, he said, we are setting free all the slaves south of what they called the Mason-Dixon line. Now, the, now, he said, we are setting free all the slaves of the belligerent states. In other words, he, what he, you have to remember, all the belligerent states were the southern states. And, he sa and they had declared themselves their own nation. And so he stands up and says, every slave of this other nation that we don't have any authority over, <clears throat> every slave in that southern nation, we are setting you free today. Well, that's mighty big of him. He did not set free the slaves in the northern states, only the southern states, right? Now, later on, they ratified, I was, I think, the 17th Amendment or something like that, which made that all men, that they could not own slaves and all men were created equal, basically. <clears throat> well, when he said that, the minute he said that, it became illegal for a person to become a slave or be a slave, Right? That's what the Emancipation Proclamation was about, was making it illegal for slaves to be owned. Now, that's when it went into the books, went into the law books. It became a law of the United States that all men were created equal. Amazing thing was, people didn't become equal until 1963. Right? <clears throat> now, it was a law. From 1863 to 1963, 100 years, it was a law that all men were equal. But they didn't realize their equality until 1963, whenever a man stood up and said, I have a dream. And they started marching, and they started, and they did peaceful resistance, and, and they, but they started what was called the Civil Rights Movement. Now, why did they need to do that? They were free. But they hadn't realized their freedom. But as far as the law was concerned, as far as the government was concerned, technically, the law was they were free. But they hadn't realized it for 100 years. They'd been free 100 years, but no one lived free until 100 years later, whenever people started getting fed up with not living in the law or the benefit of the law that had been established 100 years before. Now, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was lifted up on a tree, raised out his hands and said, it is finished. And at that moment, that was his 
Emancipation Proclamation. At that moment, now, by that time, that was for our sins. Now, before that, he had been whipped. And it was with, now notice, you're not healed because of the crucifixion. You're saved. Your sins are forgiven because of the crucifixion. You are healed because of his stripes. And his stripes was done at the whipping post before the cross. Now, just as an idea, I just want to throw this at you here. Because I'm trying to show you. I know we always tie the two together. Okay? <clears throat> who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. Well, there it is tied together, but I want to show you. They are two separate things. Now, whenever he was, when he went to Pilate the first time, when they took him to Pilate, Pilate said, I don't see anything wrong with him. I want to let him go. And they said, oh, you can't do that. And he said, okay, whip him, scourge him, bring him back, we'll go from there. So they took him out and they whipped him. Now, if you've seen The Passion, you've had a good idea of what a whipping like that was, you know, was like. It was horrible, and honestly, you've not seen the equivalent of it. It was pretty bad. <clears throat> in the Bible, it says, by his, the way you read it in the King James, it says, by his stripes, you were healed. The word stripes there in King James is plural. But if you look in the original Greek and in the Hebrew, in Isaiah 53, the word stripes is singular, stripe. By his stripe, you're healed. Now, we know that he received more than one stripe, but according to Hebrew tradition, if a person was whipped and there was more than one inch between the stripes, then you had to call it stripes, plural. But if there was less than one inch anywhere on his body where those stripes were, then the stripes were considered one stripe. So the fact that it said stripe singular means that there was not one inch on his body that was not whipped, ripped, bleeding, and torn for your healing. That's how messed up he was. The Bible says that his, his visage, his appearance, was marred so much that you could not even tell he was a man. That's pretty bad. Now, and it says, by his stripe, you were healed, were, past tense. So he did something that set your healing, and it was, now get this, this is what I want to, this is why I'm bringing you this. <clears throat> when Jesus bore those stripes, when he was whipped the way he was whipped, what that did, at that moment, that was the Emancipation Proclamation. When he bore that, I'll show you here in just a second, I'll read you the scripture itself. It said that he bore our infirmities and carried our iniquities, right? He bore our, and it even talks about uh, infirmities and diseases. The words used there, uh, kola and moloch, or moloch, means literally sicknesses and diseases. And, and again, I'll prove it to you. But I want you to realize that when he did that, he bore it one time. Now, how many times did he go to the cross? Now, did he only bear the sins of those that had died or had been on the earth at his time and before? Or did he bear the sins for everybody coming after him too? Now, if that's true, then whenever he bore the stripes, he didn't just bear the stripes of the people that were sick when he was alive and before, but it was for everybody coming after him. Amen? So if, if he bore your sins and he bore your sicknesses through his stripes, then guess what? If you don't have to live in sin and it's wrong to live in sin, then it's also wrong to live in sickness. Because what Jesus did with one, he did with the other. Now, really, if you get down to it, you have to decide. <clears throat> See, as Pentecostals, a lot of times we believed in, I say Pentecostals, charismatic, what do you want to call it? We have believed in healing, but we have worked with people and said, well, healing's not all that important. I mean, salvation is the most important. Well, that, that's true unless you're sick and dying, right? When you're sick and dying, it's pretty important to get healed, especially if you're not saved, right? Because you want to get saved, so we have a little bit more time to work with you to try to get you saved, right? So <clears throat> really, people say, well, what, what's more important? You know, well, pick one. Is it salvation or healing? Okay, who says you have to pick one? They're both yours. See, only the devil would make you pick one when they both belong to you. And he's convinced people of that. 
Now, we've always said, well, you know, it's not a big deal and we're not going to fight over it, whether if they don't believe in healing. Well, but the thing is, according to Scripture, Isaiah 53, if you can look at that right there, as a matter of fact, let's look at it. <clears throat> Isaiah 53 here. It's in the manual. It's also in your Bible. <clears throat> but Isaiah 53, in verse 4, it says, Surely... He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You say, I thought you said he's carried our infirmities and our sicknesses. And, yep. <clears throat> Where it says, borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. The word griefs and sorrows means literally sickness and disease. I'll prove it to you in just a second. He used the word born. The Hebrew word for born there is nasaw. And when it said he carried our sorrows, the Hebrew word for carried is chabal. Now, when you look at these two, they're different words, but they are actually synonyms. And if you look up the definition, it's very simple. They both mean exactly the same thing. And that means this. Both words mean this. To bear as a punishment for another so that the other does not have to bear it themselves. Now, isn't that what Jesus did with our sins? He bore our sins as a punishment so that we don't have to. Is that right? Isn't that the basis of the gospel? Isn't that, isn't that the basis of salvation? Now, you don't, you don't go and sin a little bit so that it makes Jesus bear more and, and, it, and it makes you a better person because you're bearing some of the sins that Jesus bore for you. You don't do that, right? That sounds silly, doesn't it? Because you know better. But to do that with sins... <clears throat> that would be silly. Well, to do it with sickness is the same thing. Because if he did it with one, he did it with both. Now, here's the proof. <clears throat> you look here. This is talking about sorrows and griefs, which is sickness and disease. Again, I'll show you just a minute. Matthew chapter 8, it says that very thing. But if you go down to verse 11 and 12, at the end of verse 11, it says, For he shall bear their iniquities. It's talking about sins. And the word bear there is sabal. Well, that's the same word up there for carried. It's the same words used. Now, so if in verse 4, he's talking about born and carried, nasal and sabal, our griefs and sorrows, which is sickness and disease. And then you go down to verse 11, and it says he has bear their iniquities in the word sabal. So whatever he did with our iniquities, he did with our sicknesses. Right? Then you look at verse 12. At the end, it says, And he bare, Nassau, the sin of many. So here you've got both words, Nassau and Chabal, being used, say, of how he carried our sins for us as a punishment. But the same words are used up here in verse 4 for our sicknesses and diseases. Now, here's the thing. He either did both or he did neither. <clears throat> for you to say, well, I believe he bore my sins, but I don't believe he took my sicknesses. Well, I don't know why you would think you have the right to say that. Because you're changing scripture. The scripture says the words used means whatever he did with the sins and our iniquities, he did with our sicknesses and diseases. So you have to choose. You either believe that he bore our sins and our sicknesses, or you believe, now listen carefully, if you don't believe that he bore your sicknesses, you're still in your sin. Because if he didn't bear your sickness, he didn't bear your sin. You understand? Now see, we've always been nice in times past and go, well, it's okay not to believe it. It's okay. No, it's not okay. The scripture makes it very clear. A man named T.J. McCrossan, who was a <clears throat> brilliant Hebrew and Greek scholar, said this about divine healing in the, in the atonement. He said, for any person, any scholar, to say that physical healing is not included in Jesus' atonement, for them to say that, it would prove that they are either not a scholar, because they didn't know what they were talking about, or they knew what they were talking about and were liars and were lying on purpose. That's how adamant he was about it. So I'm here to tell you tonight, according to this scripture, according to Isaiah 53... <clears throat> now, if you want me to prove it about Isaiah 53, you can go to Matthew chapter 8, just very quickly. Very quickly. Now, I fully expect people to be getting healed even while I'm speaking because as I preached, the Bible says he sent his word and healed them. 
And as I'm preaching, there's no reason why you can't get healed. As you hear the word preached, healing is life and health to your flesh, to your bones. It's all of it. So the, the word going out heals, right? We don't have to wait. You don't have to wait like get my hands on you or anybody else gets their hands on you. Just be free. Just realize that's true. He bore my sicknesses and just be free. And the minute you believe that, you get free. Amen? You don't have to do anything for it. You just believe it and you get free. Now, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 says this. When the evening was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. Now watch. Why? Verse 17. So that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. Now, when he's quoting this, when he's talking about Isaiah, he's quoting Isaiah 53.4. And he, now get this, when Matthew quoted this, he is giving us God's, he's, he's quoting this under divine inspiration. And he is giving us God's commentary on Isaiah 53. And he said that what Isaiah said was that he carried their infirmities and their sicknesses. So, <clears throat> again, whatever he said, whatever he did with our sins, he did with our sicknesses. Because right there, it proves it had to do with physical sickness, and it fulfilled the word. And you know why it fulfilled Isaiah? Because he healed them all. Now, so for Isaiah 53 to be fulfilled, he must heal them all. Now, 1 Peter 2, 24 says, By whose stripes you were healed. Now, so if you're healed by the stripes of Jesus, when did he bear the stripes? 2,000 years ago. So when technically were you healed? 2,000 years ago. Why? As far as God is concerned, the law is on the books. As far as God is concerned, he's already decreed. Everybody goes free. Everybody's healed. Why? Because Jesus bore their sicknesses with his stripes. Just like the Emancipation Proclamation, everybody's free, but it took 100 years. Now, what I'm going to ask you tonight is, how long is it going to take you? <clears throat> when are you going to get fed up? When are you going to stand up and say, I have a dream? When are you going to start saying, you know what? It ain't right. See, the, 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 the civil rights movement started in America <clears throat> whenever some people got on a bus and told a little woman, little black woman, said, uh, you got to get up. Some white people want your seat. And she said, no, I'm not moving. I'm equal to anybody else. And I have a right to sit here like anybody else. And that sparked the civil rights movement. Just one little woman. And all that came out of it just because she said, no, nope, I'm not moving. Now think about that. <clears throat> this isn't about who you are or what you've done or anything else. This is about you deciding that the law is on the books. Right? All you got to decide is it's a law. It is the law of God that by his stripes you were healed. Amen? Now, when are you going to decide that? Tonight? Amen? How are you doing? <laughs> hey, I, man, I preached in Kenya. When I was in Kenya, I was standing there preaching this little church, and they had the, the guy was standing there with a recorder, a little tape recorder, holding a microphone. And I was preaching, and he had stopped me. And he pushed the stop and turned the tape over and pushed record and <laughs> do it again. And I'm watching him and trying. And while I'm preaching, we had goats <clears throat> run across the room. I mean, run in one door and out the other. And, and I'm, I'm looking as goats. I mean, I'd never seen that before. And I'm thinking, goats. And about that, right after that, the, the children come chasing the goats. <clears throat> and I, I look and I thought, what? Well, okay. That, you ought to try to keep your attention, you know, where was I at? Let me think, what was I saying? And, and then I, just as soon as I start back, the kids come running back through and the goats were chasing them. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <clears throat> so I'm telling you, if, if you're going to try to, you know, spook me somehow, you're going to have a hard time doing it because I've I done been there, done that, okay? Very few things draw my attention away. Why? Because this is the most important thing I can do, right? There ain't nothing else that can happen much, really, that would... Honestly, I mean, if, if a fire broke out in here, most of y'all would probably run, and I'd keep preaching till the last person left. 
<clears throat> okay? <laughs> because this message is that important. Amen? <clears throat> Matter of fact, that might be getting some of y'all healed. You know, if a fire broke out, you might jump up out of that wheelchair. <laughs> Take off. Okay? That might be the first time you realize, <laughs> bless God, I'm healed. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <clears throat> so, but now, do you realize that for, for him to fulfill Isaiah 53, he had to heal them all. Amen? When you take communion, you have what? The juice and the bread. Now, thank God we eat the bread first. Because could you imagine if you drank the juice first and then ate the bread? You'd be coughing bread the rest of the service. You know, you drink the juice and <laughs> you know, because you have to have something to wash it down, right? <clears throat> but now, if you don't believe healing is in the atonement, if you don't believe by his stripes you were healed, why do you eat the bread? Because you know the juice represents the, the forgiveness of sins through his sacrifice on the cross. What does the bread represent? You see? He said, this is my body broken for you. Oh, that's the church. I got news for you. The church has never been broken for you. Right? Church ain't been broken for you. Jesus' physical body was broken for your healing. And by his stripes. We were in um, <clears throat> one place. Where was it? Kilmarnock, Virginia. Lady had this huge, huge goiter. I mean, the thing that you couldn't put your hand around it. Huge. And we were doing communion service. And I handed out the elements. We blessed it. And I handed them out. And I said, all right. I said, take this cracker. We had some crackers we were using. I said, take the cracker now. Hold it up. Say this with me. By his stripes, I was healed. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I received my healing. And his body was broken for me. And I received my healing in Jesus' name. I said, now, eat the bread. This lady put it in her mouth. Well, everybody put it in their mouth. And it was quiet. You know, a communion service is always quiet. And you can hear the crunching and all that kind of stuff. And it's quiet. It's reverent, right? And all of a sudden, this woman screams. I mean, a blood-curdling scream. You know, and immediately you're kind of like, I mean, because that's not normal, you know? Hardly ever does anybody scream in the middle of a communion service, okay? And you're standing there holding the stuff, and you're eating, and you're, you know, and you're thinking about it, and, you're, and all of a sudden this woman started screaming, and you're kind of, okay, where is it coming from? And she was over on this side, and her, she had bent over in the, the pew and was trying to breathe and was holding her, trying to hold her throat, and she was going, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, something's choking me. You know, and now we're, we're getting ready to start casting stuff out. You know, we're thinking, oh, man, she's got a devil, and we're going to cast this thing, and this ain't good. <clears throat> and so we start heading over toward her, and all of a sudden, she goes, <gasps> and raises up. This thing is gone. Gone. I mean, I mean there's a flap of skin there, from where it was in there, but the thing is gone. And all of a sudden, she said, she started breathing, and now everybody's like, okay, what's happening? And she said, when I took that bread, that cracker, and I ate it, she said, Jesus showed up. And she said, he reached out and grabbed that goiter and squeezed it until it exploded. And so now everybody's talking, they're looking, I mean, it's, you know, that's not your average meeting, okay? <clears throat> and now we're still holding the cup. And so we're all standing. I said, all right, well, glory to God. But I mean, and now everybody realized this is real, right? And I said, now, this is for the forgiveness of sins. Oh, you ought to have seen everybody. I mean, mother, <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> they, they were really concerned. They did not want to drink this unworthily. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> But, I mean, they were like, <laughs> they were pretty nervous about it. So, but I could, I could go on and tell you all kinds of testimonies and different things. I'm, just, I'm here to tell you, though, the main thing about this is this. If healing is not in the atonement, then we have no real basis of faith. We can only hope. Because the only way you can have real faith is to believe that something is done. And then you trust him that he's telling the truth. <clears throat> you know, it's pretty amazing, and I'm not going to belabor this much at all here, but I, I do want to tell you this. Here's something to think about. The first healing 
in, in the Bible <clears throat> is in Genesis chapter 17. And it's talking about how Abraham prayed for Abimelech, who was a pagan king, and, or heathen king, and he was healed. Then you go in, and the last healing before Jesus was crucified. Remember when it was? It was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember? Peter pulls a sword and takes off Malchus's ear. And Jesus put his ear back on. All right? Now, from Abimelech, the first healing, to Malchus's ear, the last healing that Jesus performed, you know, in this life, you know, when he was on, on the earth. <clears throat> At that point, now, let me, let me stop here and just ask you. What, on what basis are we healed? It, 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 would it be by faith or would it be by his stripes? It's by his stripes, right? That's the legal basis that he, he... Now, faith is the method or the means that we partake of that. But the legal basis of our healing is by his stripes. That's our legal grounds. Amen? Now... If it's his stripes that gives legal ground for healing, how did all those healings take place from Abimelech to Malchus? Because he hadn't bore the stripes. Right? So, now, what is it when you get something and you pay for it later? What do you call that? Credit. Right? Now, you know what they used to call credit in the old days? Good faith. I'll give it to you on credit. Well, I'll give it to you in good faith. What does that mean? You get it now, and I, I believe in you that you'll pay for it later. Why do you think faith is always mentioned in the Gospels? You don't really see faith much mentioned in the epistles and in the book of Acts. You really only see it one time, and even that, it was a, almost a misnomer. But you really don't see faith mentioned after the Gospels. But in the Gospels, Jesus said, well, according to your faith. Well, according to your faith, be it unto you. Well, this is faith. He always mentioned faith, but you don't see that afterwards. You never see in the epistles, you never see Paul tell people, have faith. Why? Because he was talking to believers. It is assumed that you trust God. You're never encouraged to have faith. You're, it's assumed you, you've trusted God, right? But now think about this. If healing is all based on the stripes, and all those healings were before the stripes, then all those healings were on credit right now that means <clears throat> that now you only need credit before you pay for something right I mean if, if I go down and put money in your bank account how much faith does it take for you to write a check on it none right not once, you, not once I give you the receipt and I say here's, here's the money I put in your account and you look at it and go yeah okay it's my bank my account yep okay you going to have a problem writing a check on that why because you've got the receipt that says that the money's there and the money being there it, it, it takes no faith why because the, the money being there is a fact didn't take faith money's a fact right it's there it's in your account it's a fact doesn't take faith to believe in a fact. Right? Would it, would it take faith to believe in a fact? No, it's a fact. Now let me ask you this. Did Jesus bear the stripes? So then that's a fact. Is that a fact? So then why would you be concerned about having faith for the fact? If it's a fact. Let me ask you. Right now, think of your name. What is your name? Don't tell me. Just you know it, but you know, okay? <clears throat> okay, and now, is that a fact? How could, I, how could I prove that? If I said, what's your name, how could I prove it? Maybe look at a birth certificate. Maybe look at a driver's license, right? Something like that. But in other words, for me to believe it, I can't just have you tell me, you know, unless I know you really well, and then I might believe you. But if I really want to know for sure, I need to see it written down somewhere. So when it's written down, that's more sure than if you tell me. Is that right? Why? Because you could lie to me. But if it's written down on something like that, then especially an official document, then I've got to believe it. Is that right? Come on. You can't get any more official than that. 
right? It's written down. Now, so if you tell me I'm not healed, I'm going to look and go, come on, quit, quit joking with me. There you are, says right, you are right there. By his stripes you were healed. You can't tell me you're not healed. You're right there yet. You understand? <clears throat> the biggest statement of doubt and unbelief you'll ever hear is God's going to heal me. Why? Because he's not going to. He already has. He's already decreed it. You're free. You are free. Do you understand that? This is your emancipation proclamation right here. You ought to be able to look at that and go, oh, look at that devil. Uh, oh, cancer devil. That's who I'm talking to, the cancer devil. You look right there. It says, I'm healed. It says, you can't do anything to me anymore. So, sorry, you're going to have to move. <clears throat> you need to pack up and move out. Amen? Do you understand how easy this is? I mean, I, I know if, now, I, believe me, I understand. You say, well, it's easy for you because you're, you know, in good health. And you're, well, I know, but the hardest thing is to try to get in the middle of this when you're having pains and problems. Yeah, obviously. That's why I try to get to you before you get sick. Because if I can get to you before you get sick, we can get this built into and you won't get sick again and then it's easy to stay well. But the fact is, you should be well. Jesus died so that you can be well. You say, I don't think Jesus is that involved in my, in my physical being. Then what are you doing here? <clears throat> You're sure, in, in sure interested in it, right? You spend all kinds of money trying to get fixed. Spend all kinds of time trying to get fixed. So the key here is you need to realize who you are, amen, and what is in you, what's been done for you, amen? Now, how many of you have been to the training? Okay, here's what we're going to do. Well, yeah, it's a good number anyway. <clears throat> okay, how many of you have not been to the training this week? Let me see your hands. Okay, okay. How many of you are not going to raise your hand no matter what I ask? <laughs> ah, that's a good <laughs> Amen. Yeah, there's always somebody that's going, I'm not even doing nothing. I'm, sure. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering because we, I wanted to know how many people, you know, I want to see how we were as far as, you know, people need to be prayed for and people praying. Now, if you've been to the training and you need healing, that's fine because the best way you can get healed is to minister healing. And while you're ministering, the Bible says to pray for one another that you may be healed. So it's, it's a good way to do it. Now, if you've been to the training and you don't need healing, wonderful. And you get, just get to minister. Now, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. There's all kinds of ways you can pray, okay? And what you'll do is you go out and do this more often. You'll find different ways to pray, and it'll work for you. So I'm not trying to say, do it this way. All I'm saying is, tonight, this is to get you started, right? This is not the end all. This just gets you started. But it's going to be real simple. All I want you to do is, when we do this, is we're going to... The, the people that are doing the ministry and praying for people, and I'm going to be going through and praying for people, and all right, so if you came and you expect me to lay hands on you, I'm going to do that. I have no problem with that. But other people are going to lay hands on you also because I've been training them, and they want to practice on you, okay? So <clears throat> let's give them some practice, okay? Hey, you don't mind a doctor that practices medicine, <clears throat> okay? He's practicing on you, right? Come on. So let's try this now. So, here's what we're going to do. Those of you that are going to be ministering, we're going to line you up, and we're going to try to make it so that men pray for men and women for women, okay? <clears throat> now, and it doesn't always have to be that way. It's just the best way to do it, and so we're going to do it tonight. So when you get up, we're going to line you up, and then when you meet the people you're going to be praying for, then technically you're not going to pray for them, okay? Technically, you're going to speak to their body, speak to that sickness or whatever it is they have, and you're going to command it to go. Now, two things to remember. Now, listen, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a stickler on this. Because if I'm not, we're going to be here all night. I'm going to be a stickler on it. Number one, this is not a time of fellowship. Right? This is not time to enter into discussion, talking, conversation, none of that. Right? You are here for one purpose, to get kingdom business done, all right? <clears throat> Don't talk and carry on and all that kind of stuff. Do your job. Be forceful, be direct, do your job. Now, you're going to go to the person, you're going to be polite, you're going to shake their hand or talk to them. You're going to say, <clears throat> hello, my name is, and you're going to tell them your name, and then you're going to find out their name. Why? Not to get them healed, but to be polite. 
You, you always have time to be polite. Amen? So, you're going to be polite. Then you're going to say, all right, what are we dealing with? What, what's the situation? What is your problem? What is your illness? And some, you know, I'm giving you several different ways to say it. But I want you to find out what's wrong. Now, when they ask you what's wrong, those of you that want to be prayed for, <clears throat> understand, I don't care if they, even the people that are praying, I don't care if they are doctors. Tonight, they're not. All right? Tonight, we are divine healing technicians. We are believers ministering to the sick. So, we don't want your medical history. Right? Because it'll take too long. Right? And what'll happen is, you'll start, well, it started when I was two. And, and then you'll go through. And by the time you get done, we're going to get out of compassion. We're going to get in, we are, we're going to get into sympathy. And you're going to talk us out of faith. Because we're going to hear all your problems. And we're going to end up going, well, that's bad. I mean, you get it rough. Don't you? <clears throat> and you're not going to get anything. Right? So let's just stick to it. And let's just say what we're going to say. And then find out what the problem is. And once you find out what the problem is, then you're going to say, okay, here's the problem. Now, once they tell you. Now, what we want is this. We want a name. If it's been diagnosed, just tell us the name. Now, it doesn't matter to us. Because we're probably not going to know what it is anyway. Right? But we just want the name so that we have something to kind of direct toward. And then whenever you give us that name, now if it hadn't been diagnosed or you don't know the name, then just give us some of the symptoms. Two or three, four symptoms, something like that. Now, if you say, we have a, you don't understand, I've got a dozen things wrong with me, right? All right, if it's more than two or three things, just tell them it's a bunch of things. It's, it's two or three, four things, okay? When they do that, if they tell you that it's two or three or more things, then right then that tells you this. It is a spirit of infirmity. Beyond any shadow of a doubt, that's what it is. So if they say it's this, this, and this, you say, okay, spirit, you don't even have to call those three things out. You can say, spirit of infirmity. Now, now listen, <clears throat> listen to the difference. When you speak to them, you, speak, you are not talking to the person. You are talking to the sickness, right? It will obey you. You say, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Talk to the sickness. Why would I want to talk to the sickness? It's not near as silly as being told you're going to talk to a mountain and it's going to move and jump in the lake. All right? So Jesus said that's what we could do, so that's what we're doing. Amen? So that's what will happen. Now, and, and again, don't concern yourself with our method. Just let us do it. Okay? <clears throat> now, you're going, to, you're going to talk to this thing and you're going to say, usually you're going to say something along these lines. You're going to start by saying, in the name of Jesus, or you're going to finish by saying, in the name of Jesus. But if they say, well, I've got fibromyalgia, you're going to say, all right. <clears throat> now, generally, fibromyalgia is also a spirit of infirmity, so that's okay. But you could say fibromyalgia, or you could say spirit of infirmity, in the name of Jesus. I command you now. Leave this person now. I now, understand I'm saying, I'm kind of giving it drawn out here, but I want you to say it pretty short and direct. You could say spirit of infirmity, fibromyalgia, I command you in Jesus' name. Now notice, I'm talking pretty normal, right? And then when you get to the part where you want to tell it what to do, you want to be forceful enough to convince it that it must obey you. Right? That's the best way I can describe it. And you're going to say, fibromyalgia, spirit of infirmity, I command you, in the name of Jesus, you leave this person now. You hear that? You go from talking normal to hit with your words. You get it? Now, now you're not going to do this. <clears throat> you're not going to say it. Understand, you have to speak from here. Why? Because that's where the Spirit of God is. Right? That's it. Out of your belly. Right? Will flow rivers of living water. Now, so you're going to speak from here. That's why you sound forceful. And it's not this. You don't talk from here. You don't talk from here. You really don't even talk from here. You talk from here. Amen? Does that make sense to you? You don't say, I command you, go. You hear that? That's out of here. You don't say, I'm telling you, go. That's here. <clears throat> you want to hit from here. You want to say, I command you, go. Hear the difference? All right? It's hitting with your words. Here is just talking. Even if you're yelling, you're still just talking. Hit with your words. Hit that thing, right? Command it to go. Now, as soon as you say that, then you're going to say, all right, now, do what you could not do before. And if there was something they could not do, get them to do it. 
Amen? Isn't that simple? Now, again, this should not take more than about a minute and a half. I mean, we're not talking, we're not discussing, we're not conversing. We're, we are speaking to the problem, commanding it to go, and then telling them to do what they couldn't do before. Now, your job as the sick person wanting help is to listen. When they're commanding, don't pray, don't talk, don't do anything, just receive. And when they say, do what you couldn't do before, then just do what you couldn't do before. Amen? That's all you got to do. Is that simple enough? Now, you can speak to any disease. Basically, all you're doing is telling the body, the sickness, the disease, whatever it is, to do what you want it to do, which is to go, right? <clears throat> so, just tell it to go in Jesus' name. Now, you can say go, and then you can say be healed. That's good enough too, all right? Now, at that point, matter of fact, let me, um, who have I got? Let me, give me a... Uh, Give me a young man or a person, a male. Just some, some male. Come quick. Somebody. Volunteer. Come on. There you go. You'll do it. Yeah. Oh, look at you. You can stand there and you're as tall as I am. <laughs> One step down. Okay. <laughs> now, um, uh, I'll tell you what. Come on up here, though. <clears throat> Let's go sideways where the people can see it. Can everybody kind of see here? We'll, we'll, we'll turn. <laughs> Now, we'll, we'll turn around so you can see. Now, listen. When you, generally, I don't have people lay hands. Now, now you know why I don't do this. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> but <clears throat> generally, when I lay hands on people, I don't lay hands on their head and, because you can't do that in a grocery store, right? I mean, you start to, lay, you start to reach for somebody's face, and they're going to go, what, what you doing? You know, don't get it because people don't like that. But you can say hi, right? And, okay, what am I doing? I'm laying hands. That's it right there. That's it. I don't have to do any more than that. Now, in here, we can do this. But if we want as much contact as possible, why don't we do this? Two hands. Amen? Now, you'll notice this. Go ahead and turn sideways a little bit. I know y'all can't see too much, but I know it's really hard to do this. But now, notice this. Notice what I'm not doing. Okay. Usually when I say, let me see your hands, people do this. Why? Because they're used to doing this. So when you have their hands, they do that. Now, we don't want that. The reason we don't want that is because if they do that and you do this and the power of God overwhelms them, the first thing they're going to do is lock up, grab your hands, and they're going to fall, and you're going with them. <laughs> Ask me how I know. <clears throat> okay. okay, I'm not kidding. Now, the other thing is you're not doing this because this is no different than that. You do this and the power of God hits them, and they lock up, you're still going. Now, nobody ever taught me this. <laughs> okay? I'm telling you, you're getting some benefit here. I didn't learn this from a book. I learned this by experience. All right? I learned this by ending up on the floor over a woman. <laughs> and when we went down, she locked up, and she hit. Thank God, as soon as she hit the floor, she turned loose, and I was able to brace myself and I was over her in a push up position later <laughs> and I'm thinking I, I had to tell the guys I'm like, help me up somebody grab because I couldn't move if I'd have moved I'd have been touching her and so I'm over and I'm like somebody get me up and I, I meant I knew somebody was going to come up and run up there and get a camera and <laughs> you know and I could just see this on the newspaper or something so, so I came up that night I had a revelation <laughs> okay <clears throat> Don't know where it came from, but it was there, okay? Now, and the revelation was this. I call it the quick release, okay? Now, what I do is when I take, you'll always notice when I take people by the hands, I do it just like that. You see that? Now, notice. Okay, we're just, I'm not moving anything, right? This is the way I took it. Now, look at that. You see that? Fingers to fingers. Not fingers to palm. Fingers to palm get you trapped. <clears throat> <laughs> I have thought this out, okay? It's fingers to fingers. You know why? Because if it's fingers to fingers and he starts to close his hands, I'm gone, right? <clears throat> and then he can fall if he wants to, all right? And, but I'm still up, right? So I call this the quick release, and that way I'm just, oh, okay, there you go. You can just go, amen? Got that? Yeah, so what we're going to do is this. When you start to pray, you say, okay, what do you got? Okay, I got this problem. You're going to say, in the name of Jesus, you're going to call it out. You're going to say, I command you to go. In Jesus' name, go. Now, when you say go, Here's what I want you to do. You're going to say, you're going to 
the, the sick people are going to put their hands out there. Now, you may not be holding it. You may just say, okay, just, no, right there, right, perfect, there. That's what they do a lot of times. They'll just say, nope, right there, nope, 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 okay. And you have to tell them several times, no, keep it, keep right there, okay, stop, hold it, right there. Okay, but me, because I'm telling you, it'll go back and forth. So when you get there, you say, okay. Now, that's when you start praying. While they're holding their hands there, you start praying. And this just makes it easy. And you say, in the name of Jesus, whatever it is, whatever name it is, I command you, go. You see that? Right when I said go, that's when I grab. I don't grab beforehand. I say, go. <clears throat> Hopefully stronger than that. <clears throat> okay? <laughs> but you say, go, and you hold it for, it's kind of like, in the name of Jesus, I command you, go. Two, three, four, five, let go. Isn't that simple? Well, why are you doing this? When you grab, when you speak like that, whatever you touch, the power of God will go into that. That's the release. You understand? And when you do that, then, it's, then you just hold it long enough to let it go, and then you turn loose. Now, you don't hold too long, because what it will do is, if they are uh, not receptive, because there are some people that just aren't receptive, then it'll go in, and it's like water in a bathtub. It'll come right back. So you grab, you let it out, and then you count two or three or four, and then you turn loose before it has time to come back into you, and that way it stays. All right? Simple as that. Is that easy? Pretty simple, right? And then you just leave it in them. Then you say, okay, let's do what you couldn't do before. Now, if you need to, you can pray again. There's nothing wrong with praying again. But the thing is, I don't want you there tonight praying 15 times. Right? I want you to hit it, back off, tell them to do what they couldn't do, check it out, pray once, maybe twice more, that's it. But again, this whole thing shouldn't take more than about two minutes. Amen? It's either God or it's not. You standing there for 45 minutes doesn't make it any more God. I mean, usually that's when you start trying to cover for yourself and coming up with stuff and it gets less God. So let's keep it God. Amen? All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Now, so let's take everybody that uh, <clears throat> if you're ready to start ministering, if you've been to the DHT, let's get up here. Let's line up. Hello. <laughs> let's all line up here. Now, I will, I will tell you quickly why. Okay, listen, shouldn't be any talking. No talking, no talking. This isn't fellowship time. Now, once we get started here, we're going to start ministering. And here's the thing. As you get ministered to, you are free to leave. All right? Now, you'll notice we did not take up an offering. We're not going to take up an offering why? Because you can't buy anything, and I don't want you to even think that money is involved in your healing or anything else. You understand? The, tonight's, the total thing about tonight was picked up on Jesus' tab. Amen? He took care of all of it and everything. So that you don't have to sow for your healing or anything else. Jesus has already done all that. Okay? We're just here to minister life to you and help you. So once we get done, once you're ministered to, you are free to leave and to go. Now, I will tell you before we get started, I appreciate you coming. I appreciate those of you that have come to the seminar this week. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. I look forward to seeing you again. But the main thing is, please, don't let this be the end. This is the beginning. This is not the end of it. This is graduation. This is for you to move out and start doing this. Don't make healing an event. Make it a lifestyle. All right? And when you do that. Now, I am coming back. We're already talking about dates of coming back. It looks like we'll be back in November. So we plan on coming back in November and doing some more of these kind of meetings. We, we intend to organize you into teams and start going to the hospitals, start going to nursing homes, start going out into your city. And over the next couple of times that I come, we will start getting together in smaller groups and going out into the city, doing stuff on the street, doing stuff in the malls. We're going to start hitting this thing, and we're going to start taking you out and showing you how to minister in different places and all that. All right, so this is not the end. This is just getting started. So if you want to stay in touch... Hopefully I got your information. You can go to our website. You can sign up for our newsletter. You can email me, curryblake at gmail.com. Uh, you know, there's ways you can get in touch with us. So stay in touch. If you want to be involved, get involved, all right? It's on you. I, I don't know you, so I can't contact you. You're going to have to contact me unless I have your information, okay? So I just want to say it before we get started. So now, uh, we remember, males with males, females with females. So those, now how many of you out there 
need healing. Let me see your hands. Should be most everybody else. <laughs> okay. Now, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start going through. <clears throat> Those of you who just saw who raised their hand, start going to them. Now, if we have more people praying than need prayer, wonderful. That's great, all right? That's not what the church is used to, <laughs> okay? Usually, it's the other way around. We're usually overwhelmed. So, you, what you'll do is you'll double up. If you can double up, then at that point, you can double up male and female on a male, male and female on a female, you understand? As long as there's one of the same gender there, right? So, now, we, so you can double up on that and begin to minister. So, go ahead, why don't you, those of you that need healing, raise your hands. Those of you that are in the line here, start going to them. Just start moving out to them. Now, now listen, don't start praying yet. Don't, don't start praying, all right? I'm fixing to pray first, and then I just go to them and meet them. That's it. Just go to them. Just go to them. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to pray. Now, listen carefully. One of the reasons this is going to work for you is because you're doing what I'm telling you to do and because we are in charge of this meeting, right? So I'm going to pray. There's still hands up, so keep going to them. Still hands up. Still hands up. Go to them. Make sure everybody's got, make sure everybody's got somebody. Make sure everybody's got somebody. Yeah, yeah. Make sure everybody's got somebody. All right? Now, let me, let me pray generally real quick. In the, oh, we got some more back there. Some more back there. Move on back there. If there's people, if, you, if we got some DHTs, move back there. Some more there, right there. Let's go. Right back there. Right there. Here's one right here. One right there. Let's get everybody together. Come on. Give me just a second. I need 10 or 15 good volunteers for the overflow room. Ah, okay. All right, listen up. Listen up. Listen up. If you need prayer, raise your hand. All right, now, number two, we need some DHTs in the overflow room. All right, there's people out there too. So let's take some of them out there. All right, start moving that way and going out there. Now listen, I'm going to pray real quick. In the name of Jesus, right now. We got one right there, hands up. Hands up. Let's move some people over there. Come on, let's move some people over there. Right now, in the name of Jesus, right now. I take authority right now over every sickness, over every disease. You will obey the voice of the word of God. You will do it now. In Jesus' name. You will leave them now. Right now, in Jesus' name. All right, yep, go after it. There you go. Get forceful. There you go. In Jesus' name. 